the dynamic of that spherical structure are the dynamic of a double torus uh, that looks like this. See, if I took this double torus and I took a picture of it at the right angle, it would look like two spheres intersecting as well. These are the dynamics of the, in, the, uh, of the standing wave of the surface of the black hole of the double torus predicted by this theory. And here you can see the expansion and contracting side of the universe dynamics. And this is the path of a test particle on the surface of such a black hole. This is the dynamics of the Coriolis effect. On the Earth, you find the same Coriolis effect. For instance, the weather has, you know, go uh, the 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 patterns of the weather goes down to the equator, gets hotter, and then goes back up to the North Pole and back down towards the equator, and so on. And the one uh, from the South Pole goes from the South Pole to the equator and back down, creating this exact dynamic. And uh, I thought it was interesting, although I didn't mention it at the APS, that the view of these dynamics from above is a yin and a yang. Mm -hmm. Yang. And, uh, yin yang, I'm sorry. And, uh, <laughs> you know, and we'll see in a minute why that's so crucial. But these dynamics are found at all levels. Uh, this is the paper I'm publishing now. And you can see that these dynamics are found at all levels of stars and galaxies and blazars. Uh, this is a galaxy. Galactic disks have uh, 3,000 light years vortices that emerge from the black hole at the middle. Okay? And they have huge galactic um, halos all around it. Can everybody see this? all around in here. And the stars move out from the galactic arm into the galactic halo and then back down and then back out. Go ahead. What are you saying, the obvious, to say that the double taurine uh, Corliss effect that we can imagine that our bodies have that same type of energy pattern around us? Yeah. you would, ex it, you, And that's why I think that the Buddhist shows a vortex entering at the crown chakra and then entering at the root of the of the spine and then meeting in the heart center reproducing that very dynamic and when you look at the heart center of the Buddha where the vortex meet it, the, there you find the geometry of the star of David or the geometry of the double star tetrahedron the geometry of the vacuum the singularity so it's uh, it's present in many many different traditions and actually, I, I did develop a meditation technique based on this to improve and to increase your capacity to move the information through from the vacuum into your singularity. There is a, a physical place inside your heart that has a singularity. Your heart has a little cavity between the two ventricular of the heart. And that little cavity has the highest electromagnetic field of your body. It can be measured up to eight feet away from you. And that's the battery of life that keeps your heart going. When you die, that singularity is no longer present. And I think that's one of the reasons that they're missing a bunch of weight that they can't account for that disappear when people die. The weight is the result of that singularity curving space-time creating a gravitational effect that we call weight. Go ahead. Uh, you said you developed
fabrication technique around that? Do you have that on a, a tape or a CD that you're selling? No, <laughs> not yet. Could you do that, please? <laughs> I will. I've been asked to do that for a long time. I will do it as soon as I'm finished publishing the physics papers because that has to be there first so that I'm not discredited. Uh, you got to be careful in this world. Although I'm already way out on the edge. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I'm trying to minimize the damage. Uh, if you... Uh, if you look at it, and that's soon because I'm publishing in November. Uh, in what book? Uh, it's in uh, Temple University Press. It's a peer-reviewed journal. Um, and it's just the first publishing, which is an overview. And the uh, overview then will have sections that are published in other journals, uh, probably PhysRev and, and uh, math journals for the solutions we found to Einstein field equation. But uh, here's a quasar with the same dynamical vortices going towards singularity. Now, these vortices are 10 to the 6 light, light years. That's a million light years long vortex. You know, a million at the speed of light Right? It would take you a million years to get to the end of that vortex. Okay, and that's only half. Okay? And that is that vortex is spinning at near the speed of light. Those vortexes are taught to be relativistic vortex. They spin at near the speed of light. Can you imagine the dynamics that it would take? Can you imagine the torque that generates and they haven't calculated the torque? It's like, wait a minute. No wonder you're missing energy. Go ahead. Do, do we have any idea of the proportion of how much that torque could be relative to the whole mass energy of that, shall we say? We're in the middle, system? we're in the middle of making these calculations. It's not obvious because we have to add, um, uh, we have to have uh, to add a torque uh, and a correlates effect function to the space-time manifold, and torque is written in vectors, and space-time manifolds are written in tensors. So we got to convert and all this. So it's a big job, but we're in the middle of doing that. And it's looking extremely promising. It's very very good, and so uh, we'll be able to give answers to that soon. But here, look at the fractal. This is a quasar, a million light year vortex. Here is a microquasar. Those are found inside galaxies. And those are three light years long vortexes. But the exact same dynamics. Quasars, microquasars, and clap stars. All different scales, all same dynamics. You can see these dynamics at all levels. Here's pulsars. Here's again, same dynamic that you see. This is actually a picture of these vortices going towards the center of the pulsar. And then when you took a picture of the center of the pulsar, you can see the petals mm -hmm. emerge of the octahedron in the middle of the octahedron. Look at these twistors. These are the top and the bottom of the pulsars. And like I said, the same dynamics are found on the surface of the Earth. And actually, the same dynamics are found on the surface of the Sun, on the surface of Jupiter, and so on. So the final geometry is something like this. A double vortex, a double torus, right, which generates an equatorial plane of gravitational waves. Uh, and at the singularity, the 12 vertices of the vector equilibrium fractal structure, which determine the scale of the topology of spacetime. Now we wrote all the math for this, and they work. When you write the math in group theory for these dynamics, 
you end up with all subatomic particles and all forces being accounted for. So you know when you when now when you start to see things like this. you start to think, wait a minute, how come these people knew about this? This is an ancient, ancient symbol that was found on a granite pinner, pillar in uh, Abydos, Egypt, in a temple called the, temp the Osarian Temple. Why is it that this object, this drawing, which is on the 100 ton pink pillar in the middle of that temple, is not in any picture books or history books anywhere or archaeologic books anywhere? It took me 10 years of research to go through all the books that were written on the Azarian temple from the first papers that were published from the archaeologists that found the temple to eventually you know all the papers and the books that were written none of them had this picture in it the way I got this picture is that a friend of mine went out there and took it okay why is it that this picture is not in there I'll tell you why. Because this graphic is not carved into the rock. It's not etched into the <laughs> rock. This graphic is actually burnt, laser burnt, into the atomic structure of that pillar. Now when you think of ancient civilization 5,000 years ago you don't expect them to be doing laser burn on you know hard surfaces at high levels of accuracy okay archaeologists have a really hard time explaining these things when they can explain something usually the tendency is not to popularize it so they leave it out. Some of these uh, symbols that are in the Orzarian temple, there's, a, there's no writing in all of that temple. Not one piece of writing. All there is is these things. There's a few of them. Some of them are chipped. Well, the laser burn is through the rock. So that actually, even if you chip it, it still appears on the rock. We have no current technology to reproduce this. That's why you don't find this in history books. The other thing is that the Osarian Temple is 50 feet below all the other temples at Abydos. The archaeologists tried to say, oh, the Egyptian dug 50 feet and then started building. Well, the Egyptian never did that to any other building. And actually, when the geologists went there, they went, no, that's not the case. The building was there and sedimentation piled up beside it. Well, when they calculate how long it would take to get 50 feet of sedimentation, that temple is no longer four to 5,000 years old. That temple is nine to 12,000 years old, maybe 10,000 years old. That's why archaeologists really don't like that temple. <laughs> In fact, they very rarely discuss it. Well, it just happens that if you take that symbol and you make every circle a sphere, 
then you have exactly 